I, I'm not going to give a long sales presentation about what we do. Rather, I, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what trends I see and how we see that we're fitting in there and have a few uh, few cases based on that where we have been helping companies with some of those uh, some of those trends. Uh, so I think the, the first trend that I see and that relates to what we were just talking about and what is now coming back on everybody's mind is that uh, safety will become a big issue even in 2022. So people need to need to feel uh, safe in the office. Uh, so a month ago, I would not have talked about this. You know, I would have believed that we had all, or in Denmark, it's more than 80% have gotten the vaccine, and I think the same is pretty much true uh, across Europe. But um, but even so, things are going in the wrong direction right now, and I, I think we really have to to look at that and see what we can what we can do about it. So, uh, I think Austria has pretty much completely shut down again. All businesses and and uh, and non-essential shops are shutting down again. Here in Denmark, uh, things are we're looking at the rates going up. I think it's the same in a lot of different places in Europe. Uh, and I, I think nobody can really stand the idea of uh, having to work from home for another, I don't know, 12 or six or seven months until until spring come back. So I think we need to look at uh, solutions uh, that can help us, you know, maintain or be able to still go to the office and at the same time also feel same, safe in the offices. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that can be done around that, of course, and I, I think organizations need to think about uh, think about that rapidly. Um, so of course, there's all the all the usual things that we can do around uh, cleaning. So uh, cleaning uh, should be uh, about uh, uh, the place being actually um, disinfected. Uh, so we talked to some bigger cleaning companies and, and you know, back in the day, it was all about uh, places looking clean. Uh, nowadays, it's all about people uh, feeling ensured that the place is disinfected. But there's a lot of uh, things you can do also with, with data. And that's, that's some of what we are supporting and what we have been supporting through the pandemic. Uh, so, so a, a bit of background on that is that um, so so before the pandemic, we were looking a lot at a space optimization. You know, making good sense of the the, the data from our sensors in supporting organizations, uh, downsizing and optimizing all the space that they were using. Um, then, of course, the pandemic hit, and in Denmark, the shutdown was in March. Uh, I think March 11th. Uh, last year and and people were leaving the offices they were basically sent home that basically as we all know happened across the globe and and obviously as i as i used to say to people there's not a lot of a lot of not a lot of money in in counting people in in empty buildings so so we had to do something right and what we did what we thought about and what we uh, set out to develop uh was that since we are able to uh with our sensors basically measure distance between people uh, we developed a solution for uh, social distancing uh, based uh, both on our sensor devices, but then also on existing IP camera infrastructure. Um, and so we did some uh, interesting demonstrations in, in shopping malls uh, over the summer last summer. So we would overlay, you know, distance maps on uh, on the video feeds of the existing surveillance or security infrastructure, and then helping helping these uh, these places, you know, uh, um, be aware of uh, situations where people were not uh, maintaining an ideal social distance. Uh, so the same solution we actually applied, and also uh, in a case where we were helping uh, one of the large universities in Spain, i.e., business school in Madrid. Uh, keeping uh, staying open throughout the pandemic. So what you can see here is that they were uh, they were doing, of course, the usual things of of um, um, of um, uh, what do you say, disabling the use of every every second chair, for example, in all of their meeting or in all of their lecture rooms. But then also what we implemented was. Uh, putting our sensors in all of their lecture rooms and basically measuring the distance between the students and alerting facility management staff in case that there were too uh, too high density in the in the room. So we, uh, over the course of a couple of months, installed 600 sensors uh, in in all these lecture rooms, and we provided real time and historical data. Uh, uh, and usage and peak hours in those lecture rooms 
Uh, we did push and mail notifications when thresholds were reached, uh, and we did a documentation so that the university could prove that they were not exceeding uh, regulations, et cetera, et cetera. And like anything else we do, the data from our sensors can be uh, integrated into uh, into other solutions. So I think we will see some of that coming back. We will see a need for people uh, knowing that they can feel safe coming back to the to, to the office and universities and other places, uh, and that is a combination of, uh, of course, the uh, the cleaning, the the um, the sanitary part of it, but then also uh, for companies and uh, universities, etc., to have the right solutions in place uh, to make um, to make people feel safe as they come back. So I think that's the one trend. Uh, the other trend, uh, then, I would say, is around um, around flexibility. So everybody's talking about uh, that the workspace will never become what it was before. I think maybe in 10 years we can have a different discussion and see what actually happened. Uh, but at least the current trend is that companies understand that they need a lot more flexibility. Uh, I think most of the people here will probably have followed all the... Uh, discussions or news that came out of the big tech giants in, in, in the U.S., for example. So after a couple of months, uh, some of them declared the office uh, dead. We could all work, you know, more, much more efficiently from home and there was no need to maintain all these big corporate offices. Uh, then another um, few, you know, four or five months went by uh, and all of a sudden it was all about, yeah, we need people back uh, as soon as possible. And I, I think the uh, the pr the prime case of that was Facebook that um, a few months ago uh, suffered a big uh, global outage of their services, and I read somewhere that that was uh, that was a trigger for senior management to basically uh, demand that everybody would come back to the office because they saw this as a consequence of of that. Um, and I think likewise, you know, um, across uh, global companies, uh, leadership is realizing that it doesn't, it, it certainly doesn't work for everybody to work from, from, from home, you know, in, in any foreseeable future. Uh, instead, we would want some sort of flexibility, and this has been touched upon in, in numerous of the, of the previous presentations. Um, some of the key things that I see is that it's, it's the most important a tool to maintain a corporate uh, culture. So, uh, you know, if you have if you have a steady um, steady group of employees in your company, it may work well to um, to work from home. Everybody knows who everyone else is. But as soon as you start changing your uh, your employees, you know, you have young people coming in. They don't know the culture. They don't know the the senior people that they need to learn from. And so, you need to make sure, and the company companies need to entice these people. Uh, to come back into the office uh, to do collaboration so that that I, I think overall we'll see that the office goes from a, a workspace to a collaboration space. Um, and and of course, the question then is, how do you create the best collaboration space? What, what sort of layout do you need? What sort of uh, facilities, what sort of, you know, ideation spaces, uh, creation spaces, uh, meeting zones and, and uh, all of these other fancy types of spaces do you really need, um, and 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 how will people actually use them? And so we're sort of arguing, and that's what we're seeing in conversations with our customers that you basically need to have the data for all of this, uh, uh, more or less from from day one, and you need to make that data human centric, uh, hence the headline, uh, because you need to make sure that the data will support. Uh, employees in in sort of maximizing their uh, collaboration and, and co-working with uh, with their peers. Um, so uh, so basically, we need to understand what works in terms of layout and in terms of these new types of spaces, and for how long will that work. So I think also that we will see a much more dynamic workplace where things will change over time. So you know, current situation with uh, infection rates going up. Uh, we'll definitely see a drop in people coming in, uh, but other other changes and other situations might lead to uh, different different needs of the users. And I think there is a there's a, a growing realization among uh, companies, big and small, that uh, they need to be able to adapt to these to these changes. And in order to do that, you need to basically have the data to uh, to support what works in in terms of. Um, in terms of understanding employee behavior and what what the employees really need uh, uh, when they come into the office, 
uh, and, and you need that data with a really, uh, a really high level of, uh, of granularity. So it's not enough to know how many people are on the floor, for example. You can measure that by measuring the entrances and exits, but you really also, also need to understand what types of spaces are being used. And one of the things that really sets us apart is that we can measure basically any type of space. It doesn't have to be uh, a group of desks where you put a sensor under the desk and see how, how it's being used. Uh, we can simply mount the desk you know, on the wall or in the, in the ceiling and then measure any type of space uh, that has been created for uh, you know, doing collaboration among the, among the people. And, and sort of to give you a second example of how we support that, this is again actually from a, uh, from a university, but this is uh, one of the Danish universities here. And what we're doing here is we're creating an overlay of understanding how the students are uh, using the, uh, the big lecture room in this case here. So all the, the heat map that you see on the left left hand side, all the red dots here are where, where the students are sitting. Uh, again, it can be used for creating a safe environment, but it can also be used for uh, getting a, um, a better understanding of how the students uh, use the uh, use the, le the lecture room, how they engage with the lecturer uh, during the set, uh, the uh, sorry during the uh, during the lecture, and so on and so forth. So, basically, another example of understanding in a little more detail. Uh, what works uh, in terms of supporting, in this case, students, but, you know, it could be, of course, the same in an office, understanding these new types of spaces, how are they being used by the students and how, um, how, can, how, can, the, uh, how can the office or how can the university support uh, what is really needed by, by the users of the building. So a much more user-centric approach to, uh, to how you run and operate a building. Uh, the third big uh, theme as I see it is obviously sustainability and and that's that's something that I welcome very much in fact when when I started the company uh, about five and a half five and a half years ago it was really with the purpose of uh, helping controlling energy sources in real time so the idea was that by by having live occupancy data for every room and every space in a building uh, you could feed that data into the building management system uh, which could then in turn control the energy sources. So in particular, ventilation and lighting uh, based on live occupancy rather than just basing on, uh, based on, on presence in, in individual spaces. And so we saw at the time uh, three, four years ago that there was not too much appetite for actually doing that. A, a few companies were successful, uh, but overall there was not too much appetite for that. And what I'm now noticing on the other side of the uh, uh, pandemic or on the other side, I've said during uh, what has happened over the past year or so is that there's a, a lot more awareness of sustainability in buildings. And I think in particular uh, among the users of the building, and I can give you a good example that we recently hired a younger uh, marketing person in our company and she realized that there was no sorting of the trash in, in this facility where we are. Uh, so she was really actually upset with that, and basically she started bringing home some of the recyclable trash like plastics and, and cardboard, etc., because she was not happy with the fact that this particular facility, at least so far, was not doing anything in terms of, of trash sorting and thereby sustainability. And I think we will see that users uh, will demand and support a more sustainable uh, way of operating building. Uh, buildings. It has been uh, said many times that you know 40% of the world's energy is used in buildings, and I think uh, even you also said it in the previous presentation. There's really no need to uh, to use energy where people don't actually need it. So that's a clear clear trend there. So there's something technically that can be done, but I think we can also we will also see some uh, gamification around that. So. Um, I recently took part in a workshop uh, cross-disciplinary uh, here in Copenhagen with architects, engineers, uh, real estate uh, stakeholders, etc., 
uh, talking about how gamification could also help people be more aware of the state sustainability because it's it's difficult as a as a single user of a big building to feel that you can really make a difference but we could imagine things like uh, gradually filling the building based on on the actual presence so uh, having different zones and leading people to these different zones as the building starts to fill up but that means that you can save energy in a lot of a lot of different areas of the building uh, throughout the day and 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 basically only need uh, use the energy uh, where it's needed and you could do that by sort of gamification by rewarding uh, the the building users with you know different re rewards based on uh, contributing to that kind of sustainability and so I see that that uh, users will demand but but then also needs to be uh, enticed to to contribute to making buildings uh, more sustainability uh, more sustainable so so the final uh, trend that I, I that I'd like to highlight is that um, we're observing that uh, facility management is becoming a strategic uh, tool in organizations. I think this is really important because traditionally smart buildings has been, um, you know, uh, a part of the responsibility of facility management, but also facility management in many organizations has not uh, had, you know, a lot of a lot of leverage or, you know, has not had the uh, the, the the importance that it, that it, that it really should. But but we've seen. My observation is that there's a there's a big change going on there uh, in that uh, facility management really took on the uh, the task of uh, supporting employees uh, during uh, COVID during the uh, during the lockdown. You know, creating the right types of solutions for bringing people back. And I think this has put you know facility management into a very very. Uh, important role in a lot of organizations and becoming a strategic tool uh, for for senior management also in big organizations. And I, I think this is something that we as a community uh, around smart buildings should really uh, welcome because I think it, it will make uh, it will create a lot of opportunities uh, for the whole uh, for the whole ecosystem around uh, ecosystem around uh, building operations and 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 honestly. honestly uh, make life easier for a lot of, of, of companies such as ours. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll end on the note that, you know, key takeaways are uh, focus on safe safety for the employees, uh, sustainability for employees, having flexible solutions that can easily, that can be easily adapted to the true needs of, of, of the users. Um, and then most importantly, perhaps, uh, we need to be able to provide actionable insights for senior management to make the right decisions on what to do and how to develop the facilities that we're in uh, in order to truly cater to the needs of the, of the users. And I think I'll, I'll end it on that note. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paula. Some great uh, insights. I have some uh, some questions for you, if that's okay. Absolutely. Who needs to care about bringing people back to the office? Yeah, that's. Uh, I think uh, broadly in the organization, right? I, I think uh, senior management for for one should really, and I, I think it's really about uh, company culture. Coming back to what I said before, uh, you you cannot develop, you cannot sustain and develop a corporate culture which is really important for companies if if people don't get to meet over the coffee machine or in you know diff, all these informal meetings i think you so previously called it bump the the bump effect right that when you bump into people and you have this effect and also um, we talked to companies that said well all the young all the young people are coming in but the the senior people or the the, uh, the older people, I can say that because I'm I'm getting there myself, right? They they, <laughs> they, they tended to prefer uh, to work from home. But it's really important for the company culture that we bring everybody in, and I think we need to see operation of building and the and the um, the whole facility management as a as a very strategic tool for that. Yeah. Well, you see also that uh, uh, these these smart buildings is um, is focusing on um, on the workforce of the of the future. So, yeah. who will be the winners and the losers in the game of attracting those best people? Yeah. No. I, I think it's it, the winners will be those who really uh, want to understand what is needed in the building. You know. So, 
uh, not just saying, okay, we're going to throw in a bunch of phone booths, we're going to throw in a bunch of meeting boxes and uh, quiet, you know, rooms or whatever people call all these different spaces, but really has the will to understand how is it being used, who tends to use what, how can we, you know, how can we really understand if there's some deficiency that we that we really need to address and so it's not enough just to make your space cool you really have to also understand how people use and interact with it and and use that for making the necessary changes yeah yeah and then of course the question uh that everybody's talking about data 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 so data mm. is good but what can you really do with it yeah, that's true, and and so, and so, a comment on that is that so we were sort of uh, so I've I've been with this now for for six years, right? And 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 six years ago, everybody just yeah, we just need data, right? So just gives us lo just give us loads of data, and we'll uh, we'll figure out what to do with it. And then essentially, you know, you may provide them with monthly reports, very detailed uh, data, and you know they would maybe month one, two, three, look at it and say, wow, this is super interesting, you know, maybe a little bit here, but then gradually stop actually looking at that because they don't know what to do with it, right? So this data fatigue that we've seen uh, really needs to be, um, you need to address that and you need to make sure that you, you create these actionable insights that I talked about, really creating very high level insights into building usage and uh, especially making it very easy to understand deficiencies and and things that you that you need to do something about as a as a building operator or facility management or whatever your responsibility is. Yeah, so you will need to do something with it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and how will the user of buildings truly benefit from all this data? Yeah. So again, so coming back, so we're we're focusing now a lot of of a lot on. On creating real-time value to the users, so we do a lot of integrations of the sensor data uh, with different types of platforms. We are working with indoor navigation, where we can easily, you know, create a, a, a very nice uh, view of where people can find an, an empty space, or helping, you know, directing people in the direction of where there's not a lot of people if it's during the pandemic or where there's already a lot of people where you want to save on energy and and having people in different zones yeah. uh, but then but then also by by truly understanding how the how the building is being used and you know looking at um, so we may see that all the all the meeting rooms are booked all the time that's the thing everybody complains about all the time right but what if you have just the right capacity but then trying to start to understand how many times are people actually um, um, unsuccessfully trying to book a meeting room or book someplace right if you can start tapping into that data as well and see how that creates a, a subpar experience and then take that into account when you start to to make changes then uh, then you can basically benefit a lot and the users can benefit a lot by getting a, a much better uh, experience and then in the near term feeling uh, more safe in the building yeah and then one more question that i have for you uh, uh today uh, some other speakers also talked about uh, facility management mm -hmm. how come facility management uh, they come in play uh, because well a couple of years ago nobody was talking about facility management it was really about the real estate people but now uh, facility yeah. management is actually there I think it's a really good question. I, I can I can best perhaps answer it with an example of um, uh, a conference I recently attended, and it was a global Danish company, and they were talking about the journey of facility management during the pandemic. Um, and basically, what when, when the when people were sent home, uh, the facility the head of the global head of their facility management he reached out to HR and he asked, so what are you going to do about you know people working from home? And they were like, uh, we don't know. But then, you know, facility management basically uh, took the responsibility uh, and provided all the right solutions, uh, the infrastructure, everything. And so in that, you know, just basically became the strategic, uh, the strategic tool uh, during the pandemic. And I think it, it just ties in with the bigger picture that, uh, you know, operation of buildings is not just about uh, saving uh, on on the energy here and there and making sure everything is running in terms of the technical installation, but it's really a key tool for providing that right user experience that will help bring back people, that will help, you know, create, sustain and develop the corporate culture. 
Yeah, and, there, and that is exactly where facility management is getting in. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, I think it's good. And I think it's also on the, the, the table of the board. So everybody is talking yeah. about now about real yeah. estate. So yeah. I think we have some right momentum. I think it's very good. Indeed. Indeed. So let's just get, let's just get on the other, let's all get that third shot and, and, and move on. With and life. move on and get the 2020 exactly. uh, started. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you very much for your insights, uh, Paula, and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for giving me the time. Have a great afternoon. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.